Hey everybody, welcome to the Song Revolution Podcast, brought to you by Nashville Christian Songwriters. Nashville Christian Songwriters exists to empower Christian songwriters worldwide. I'm John Chisholm, and this podcast exists to bring you valuable songwriting insights, inspiration, interviews, and just all around good fun with some of the greatest songwriters, producers, arrangers, artists, and creatives, and beyond. You can find out a whole lot more about us at NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com. Hey everybody, John Chisholm. Welcome to the Song Revolution Podcast, where we get to get into the minds, the lives, the hearts, the songs, and all the stuff behind great industry influencers, songwriters, record company people, and we just have a great time. I love this show. I love doing this show. Share it out. Have some fun with it. Uh, Tell your songwriter friends or your mama, your daddy, anybody that might be interested in just spending an hour with us, getting behind the scenes with some great music folks. I hope you're getting a lot out of this and we'll support and share it out. Leave us a review if you want to. Go over to iTunes, check review, and tell them how fantastic this show is for you. Now, today I have a special treat for you because somebody that you might not have heard of, but who is, who has been and continues to be a very influential songwriter, Lowell Alexander. Now, Lowell, you might not have heard his name, but I guarantee you've heard his songs if you've been a fan of Christian music at all for any length of time. Uh, he has had, I think, 600. He's had over 600 songs published, and he's had songs recorded by people like Point of Grace, Selah, Glenn Campbell, Margaret Becker, Mac Powell, Amy Grant, Art Garfunkel, for crying out loud, Sandy Patty, Matt Marr, The Martin, Steve Green, Bill Gaither Vocal Band, Natalie Grant, Kim Hill, First Call, Allie Holcomb, Phillips Craig and Dean, Cynthia Clausen, Susan Ashton, Shall I Go On, Donnie Osmond, For Him, The More Mormon Tabernacle Choir, West Hampton, the London Philharmonic, Bonnie Keene, Marie Osmond. Well, there's Marie. Uh, great, amazing people. And it just goes on and on. Mark Harris, Janet Pascal, Moya, I think that's her, how you say her name, Moya Brennan, Christine Dente, Truth, Glad, Joyce Martin, on and on and on. This guy is a monster songwriter. He counts as his influences his own father, Johnny Mercer, J.S. Bach, uh, Rogers and Hammerstein, Fanny Crosby, George Gershwin, Barry Manilow, Lerner and Lowe, Elton John and Bernie Taupin. And it, man, it just goes on. He's written with some of the best of the best. And this man, I had to cut it off because we just could have gone on and on and on. He's a true storyteller. He's a true master of the art and craft of Christian songwriting. And even if you have never heard of Lowell Alexander, I know you're going to love him as much as I do. So sit back, grab a sweet tea, spend some time with me and Lowell Alexander. All right. Well, hey, Lowell, welcome to the show, man. It's good to have you. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, I've been looking forward to this. Uh, Bonnie Keene uh, connected us. Uh, you and I were writing uh, around the same time here in Nashville, uh, but we never really connected on a deep level. But, man, I've known your name. I've known your songs. I've known a whole lot about you, and it's just an honor uh, to have you on and get to know you a little bit today. Thanks, John. That's kind of you. Yeah. Well, I love your story, man. I, I love uh, people probably don't know your story, but, uh, you know, getting discovered, uh, by Rich Mullins, you know, back in the day, just kind of accidentally, can you share a little bit of that with us? Yeah. Uh, you know, I was a, uh, uh, teacher and I, I, uh, was, uh, teaching at this school, which was also a church. It was a Christian school and, uh, Rich was coming there to play and he was late and so they had you know about 300 kids uh there and the natives were restless and so the somebody the principal or whoever came over and said can you play and sing something while they they all knew i was uh you know did all that and and i did and while i was i played two or three songs then uh they uh while i was doing it You know, Rich came in the back and he stood there. And I remember specifically sitting at the piano and 
you know, uh, I knew who he was. I'd never met him, but I knew, you know, his music, especially singing praise to the Lord, because age to age, that record meant so much to me as far as, you know, kind of directing my path toward uh, writing Christian music. And so there he was. He was in the back with his arms crossed, <laughs> staring at me. And I was like, oh, Lord, there he is. So, you know, um, um, he was just as kind to me and uh, generous. And, you know, uh, basically he took my foot and put it into the door of the music business. He took me straight to uh, the third floor of the tree building. You know, after hearing me play, went up to a room, heard me play, took me to Music Row and introduced me to Randy Cox. And um, that's how that's how it happened. So. Wow. That now that's like a movie, right? I mean, that's like everybody's dream that some famous person would walk in and, and think they were worthy of being taken to Music Row. But how did that feel? I mean, was that just like overwhelming or? Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's a good question, because I'll tell you the story. When I walked into the, you know, the old tree building is now Sony on 17th Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up writing on staff for both tree. And then as it changed into Sony for years and years. And uh, the first time I went into the tree building, the old tree building looked like a glorified Taco Bell. You know, it was it was just this stucco thing, and it looked like they sold burritos in there. But, and I'm not sure who designed <laughs> it, but it, you know, it was kind of weird. So I pull up with Rich. We walk in the door, and the first thing I notice as I'm walking down the hall on the left is a airplay, these airplay plaques, and for the songs there. The first one is Green Green Grass of Home, right? And mm. so I'm like, oh man. This is green, green grass of home. That's berserk. And so then I walk a little bit further. The next one is Heartbreak Hotel. And I'm like, uh, oh, man. Uh, no this is, kidding. This, this is ridiculous. And then I turned the corner and Willie Nelson walked right by us out the front uh. door. And, and I thought <laughs> to myself, all right, as I got on the elevator with Rich and went up and got off the elevator, and, you know, was walking back to the back. Randy's office was back on the right at that time. He had a grand piano in his office up on the third floor of the building. And I was thinking, okay, if I vomit, am I going to do it in my shirt or should I head for a <laughs> trash can? So that's, that's exactly how I felt. But that was a good question. That so is anyway. great. Oh, man, that's great. So... How long did it take you to kind of settle in and start getting songs placed? Uh, you know, Randy's a legend and we've had him on the show and he's a good friend. And, you know, that dude is is an absolute icon uh, for Christian music publishing, you know, with Amy and Michael W. and Rich and you and Phil McHugh and so many others that, you know, he managed. So how long did it take before you kind of felt like you were in the groove? Well, you know, that, and that's you know, the the overnight success story, right? I had been writing songs since I was 12 years old. And at this point, you know, I'm 20, 22, 21. I got out of college when I was 21. I was 22 years old at this point. And so um, they didn't sign me immediately. I wrote on a per song basis, right? I would write, I would write, uh, I would, when I played for Randy, I played him about 20 songs and he liked like two of them. Right. So, uh, he would demo them and, uh, I would come back and forth from Nashville and I stayed with Rich. I lived at his house and, and I would leave my teaching job and take personal days and all this stuff. And I would leave on Thursday and drive up on Friday and stay till Sunday and drive back late Sunday night and, back and forth from Atlanta to Nashville, Atlanta to Nashville, Atlanta to Nashville. And, you know, doing all I could do on Fridays to get stuff demoed and, and to show Randy new songs. And so it took me about two years before he offered me a contract. And when he offered me a contract, if I'm not mistaken, well, we, we, I can tell you where I was. We were in the tree building in the studio there. And he came down and he said, would you like to write for us? 
And I said, y- you bet. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and, and so he put the contract on the console uh, down there in the studio. And he, and he, uh, now this was, you know, naive of me, but I knew Rich and trusted him and, uh, you know, everybody. And then I'd been around Randy. I knew what kind of man he was and whatnot, but it was like a two page contract. Right. And as you know, when you get deeper into this whole thing, you know, those contracts turn into 30 pages pretty quickly and, and that kind of stuff. But this was a two page contract. It was front and back, right? Front and back. And, uh, he said, I said, do you have a pen? He said, don't you want to read it? <laughs> I said, no, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Nobody but, should ever do that. <laughs> no. And, and I was, no. So, I was so thankful to have that, um, you know, beginning job as a songwriter and, and to be able to prove myself. And that's, that's all I wanted is the opportunity to prove myself. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think I got $50 advances on songs, you know, something like that, maybe 35 for a co-write, something like that. It was, wow. uh, you know, I, I would come home at the end of the month and have having worked all month and, and I would have like a $170 check in my hand, right? And my wife, wow, was like, wow, what, what's, what's happening here? But, uh, yeah, you know, that, mm. that's how it went, but I, it was the opportunity, you know, it was the opportunity that they gave me, uh, to learn. And that's what I was there to do. And so long story short, and I know I'm circling the wagons here, but long story short, my first recording was a print project and the song was a co-write with Phil McHugh. And, mm-hmm. um, and that's only because I was on staff and he was doing a teen, a teenager musical, those things that were popular back then around his song, people need the Lord. And so that was my first published song. And it took, you know, from the time I first saw Randy to the time I had my first published song, uh, about three years. Wow. I think that's important. I think that's significant for people that are listening to realize that when you have that relationship that's begun with a publisher, it doesn't necessarily mean overnight success. So no, no, it doesn't. And also it's important to understand that this uh, whole thing uh, is not about instant gratification. You, you really have to work and learn your craft. And that's, that's what was happening to me as I went along. And I still, you know, for years, I would write probably 10 songs and then one of them would come out of those 10 to be recorded or put into print, somehow published. But I was about seven years into my career as a professional writer before it really kind of just clicked onto me. And it was a matter of, you know, I often compare it to like being a cow in between two electric fences. Right. And when you veer off to the left, you get shocked. And when you veer off to the right, you're like, ow, hey, hey, I got shocked again. (laughs) And then you veer off to the left and pretty soon it forces you to walk down the middle so you don't get shocked anymore. And that's what it's like. And you get shocked by A&R people that tell you, you know, that you're horrible and publishers that correct you all the time and artists that go, what's this guy doing here? And you know, all kinds of, there's all kinds of negative stuff thrown at you. And I know that this is the Christian music business, but man, I can't tell you how many people told me that they didn't know if there was a place for me in town or that I couldn't write or, you know, just a wow. lot of, a lot of, uh, beating up a lot of negative wow. uh, stuff and wow. very little, very little encouragement, but that's where a guy like Randy comes in because Randy stands in the gap. And encourages to go, so I know that you can do it. I know that you have what it takes. You're just going to have to continue to develop. And wow. boy, you know, that's invaluable. I mean, that, and that's what that guy, uh, is about. You know, he's about, he's the best song guy I've ever seen. First of all, he knows a hit. I, I, I've got story after story of bringing demos into him where he'll look at me and he goes, that's a hit, right? Or, that's a big piece of print right there. And then it, it nearly always turned out to be that way. But wow. just the encouragement on top of the skill of, of knowing 
what a great song was and being able to help you edit the song. The encouragement that he gave was just invaluable. Wow. Wow. You know, and he is that way and he really has helped so many people and, and still, he's still doing coaching and, and helping people. So that's, that's absolutely amazing. So you went on to so far in your career, uh, have over 600 songs recorded in print, amazing lists of artists who've recorded uh, you know, your songs, uh, Point of Grey, Sayla, Glenn Campbell, Margaret Becker. I'm not going to read them all, but Amy Grant, Art Garfunkel. I want to hear about that one for sure. Uh, Sandy Patty, Matt Marr, very current guy. Uh, of course, of Martin, Steve Green, Gaithers, Natalie Grant, on and on. Some of my heroes, people I love so much. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir, for crying out loud. So, um, so obviously it stuck, obviously, you know, you got it and, uh, have wound up doing this. What, when you look back now, and I also want to talk about how you're, why you kind of walked away for a little while and, and why you're, you're kind of making your comeback, I guess, if I can call it that, uh, from a, from a com- well, from a conversation we had earlier, you know, just sure. about what's going on, yeah, I, I think sure. it'd be real interesting, but when you look back on. 600 songs, you know, give or take. I mean, does it just blow you away? And, you know, what what would be some of the highlights, you know, from all of that? You know what, John, that, and that's a good question. And I don't know that I've ever really thought about it in those terms of 600 songs. I think it was such a day-to-day grind, you know, and, and, and grind in a, in a good way often. But it was also a very difficult job. And you have to remember, um, you know, I, when you're a staff writer, you know, you're under, a, you're under a contract to write so many songs a year. And I believe my last couple of contracts were 22 songs a year, something like that. And, and you know, people go, all right, 22 songs, you know, that's nothing. And that's, you know, a couple a month or whatever. But you have to remember, every co-write is a half a song. And every time you write in thirds, that's a third of a song, right? And mm. um, and to keep the ideas flowing and, and keep stuff going and trying to, you know, write with artists, that's one thing that I got into uh, a lot of is after a few uh, of, uh, you know, recordings, I started getting calls from artists. Hey, help me develop my idea, right? And and so, you know, you're, you're, sometimes you're sitting in the room with a, like a group, right? So you've got, I mean, I wrote one song, uh, with, with, now this is the only one that I ever did this with, but it was a song on, we worked on Dave Clark and Tony Wood and I worked on the Experiencing God album for John Mays. And we wrote, mm-hmm. wrote one of those songs, uh, with five people on it. And well, and you know, I, I say it's five. I'm, I'm pretty sure the guy doing the lawn in the front yard was on it. The guy at Arby's in the drive-through window. <laughs> I think he was. I think he was a co-writer on it. I'm not. I'm not sure how many I had on it, but I think. I think five, maybe six or seven. Who knows? But <laughs> um, you know that when that pointed toward a quota, you know that's a fifth of a song. And so when you start talking about 22 songs, you're talking about with co-writing. Uh, 44 at the least. And when you start to divide it into thirds, you're talking more along the lines of if you write some of them at thirds, you're talking about more like 50, 55 songs in a year that you have to write to get picked wow. up for your next option. And so 600 published songs starts to sound kind of minimalistic when you think in those terms of how many songs mm-hmm. have to be written um, under contract. So, you know, that's the way I kind of think of it. I don't, I don't really, you know, it's just, it's odd, I guess, but man, I'm old too. You know, I mean, shoot, <laughs> after, after you get this old, do you know, you should have 600 published songs. The last time I had a birthday cake, it looked like a prairie fire. <laughs> I love that. I love that, man. Well, you and me both, but uh, just to celebrate our longevity and be, be thankful <laughs> to still be, still be kicking around here. Right. Well, yeah. when you when you look back on that career, though, um, I mean, what was your Amy Grant song? I mean, iconic Amy. What or how many songs yeah. did you have with her? I mean, tell well, us a little bit about, about that. My my um, Amy Grant recording. <coughs> Sorry, John, I've had a cold. 
But uh, right. my Amy Grant, my Amy Grant recording was uh, was off of the Mercy Project uh, that mm-hmm. that uh, uh, came out, and I it was very uh, minimal thing. I wrote the verse lyrics uh, for a song that Jeff and Gayla Borders brought to me, and so mm-hmm. uh, my my main my main artist, you know, were the points as they're known here at the house, and you know, I had. Uh, quite a few point of grace recordings and mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Amy was a very fortunate thing where I happened to be in the right place at the right time and they needed help on a song and she ended up recording it. And it was called mm-hmm. Irresistible Love off of the Mercy Project. But, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, but um, I wrote the really dark lyrics <laughs> in the verse talking about <laughs> walking on a ledge. <laughs> So, we'll, have so to, anyway. we'll have to pull that up, pull that up, yeah. and, and and review that one again. But and yeah. well, what about the Art Garfunkel for crying out loud? I mean, what's how did that happen? And what's uh, maybe I should have well, gone back and researched all that. But no, that's, that's yeah. The, you know, we, Art we, Garfunkel. Billy, yeah, Billy Simon and I were writing a, a, a lullaby project, um, mm-hmm. and we were. Um, we went to Los Angeles to pitch the Lullaby Project to Sony Wonder, um, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I remember sitting in the offices. We went in this big boardroom, and we had demoed three of these. They, they were kind of like cowboy lullabies. I mean, for a better way to put it, he was living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and we kind of you know going back and forth with that. Although Last of the Moon was written in my house. Uh, when Billy came over one day, and before I tell you about the recording, I'll tell you about the song. We uh, we uh, went for a walk, just talking one day, and wound up a couple miles from the house. And uh, you know, we were kind of straightening up this old cemetery, family cemetery that was out in the woods somewhere, and kind of pulling some branches off of markers and whatnot, and talking. And then we walked back to the house. And I went back to the room with the piano in it, and Billy sat in the kitchen, and I started playing. And he was in the kitchen getting something to drink. And he stuck his head in, and he says, what's that you're playing? I was like, I don't know. I'm just doodling around. He said, well, keep playing that. So I kept playing it and just kind of developed it. And he sat in the kitchen, and we wrote that song right there in about 30 minutes with him in the kitchen and me back in another room. We weren't even in the same room. Mm. He sat at the kitchen table. And I was back playing the piano, and he just kept listening and kept writing, and and um, so that's the way that turned out. But we were out in California pitching this lullaby project. And that song was a part of that thing, and we were sitting in this giant boardroom at uh, Columbia, and uh, and you know <clears throat> that was the first song they played, and and boy, they were like. Yeah, you know, this is going to work. So the next thing I know is they're like, we're going to cut this song on Garfunkel. He's doing a a record of this kind of stuff. And uh, then wow. to boot, it was, it was Jimmy Webb, right? It was Jimmy Webb producing yeah. it and playing the piano on the song too. So I was excited wow. about that. And, and that was a fun, that was a fun thing. But then the song, Steve Amerson cut the song too, did a, had a great recording of it. And then Dallin mm-hmm. Vale Bales, who was the Phantom of the Opera on Broadway, uh, cut the song too. So it's, nice. it's uh, uh, no, no, I take that back. I'm sorry. Uh, he, that was, that was another song that he cut. That was another song. Uh, so, well, hey, you got a song cut on the Phantom. I mean, golly, that's <laughs> another. Another icon, <laughs> but you know, our like our friend uh, Jaron Davis, you know, um, Barbara Streisand cut. Uh, yeah. You know, we're standing on holy ground. So when you have yeah. someone, you know, like Glenn Campbell, Amy Grant, Art Garfunkel, you know, it's like those are those are huge, huge yeah. uh, resume and, builders, right? I mean, well, Dallin, the, the guy I was just talking about. And I don't know him, I, but, but you know, obviously he recorded my song, but I've never met him. But he he's the one that did the song that Glenn Campbell recorded. And so that's, I think I just, uh, you know, 
some type of uh, dementia. I confuse the two in there. So uh, anyway, all that to say is, um, yeah, Dallin, I wrote a song called Come Harvest Time that Glenn Campbell cut. And then Dallin and Steve Amerson cut that. And then Steve Amerson also cut the Art Garfunkel song. You see how uh, it rolls, John. You know, yeah. you've been around, you've oh, been around yeah. the block. Once, oh, yeah. once you get a recording, you know, I mean, several people usually record the bigger you know, songs, right? So, yeah, yeah, it's, well, it's a lot of fun. We're going to take just a quick break and talk about something that I think is going to be very valuable for you as a Christian songwriter. So, check it out. Do you feel like God's given you a bunch of songs, but you don't know what to do with them? Do you feel like you've got a real call on your life to write, but you're clueless about where to start? Or maybe you've got writer's block and you're wondering if you'll ever get the creative juices flowing again. Well, we've got you covered with NCS Membership. NCS Membership is all about community and how to grow in this calling you feel deep inside to be heard. We get it. We know that you just want to honor God with your talents and be a good steward of what he's given you. And that's why NCS membership could be your next right step to grow, learn, be challenged, get connected, and ultimately fulfill your dreams to glorify God and reach others with the same passion you feel. It's designed to help you tell your story and to reach listeners who will love your songs. With your NCS membership, you'll receive two free song critiques, 24-7 access to valuable masterclasses on topics such as modern hymn writing, worship writing, song form, lyric development, and recording home demos, as well as discounts for other NCS products, and a deep connection into a community of creatives who get you. There are a lot of songwriters out there, so you need to be the best you can be to stand out, be heard, and become the songwriter you were born to be. Just go to NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com now to check out all the great benefits of becoming part of a decidedly Christian community of songwriters from all over the world. NCS Membership, your next right step to being heard. Well, I just hope that you'll take advantage of that and check it out. All right? We bring you good stuff here on the Song Revolution podcast. So back to our episode. That was kind of the the first iteration, you know, that lasted for a lot of years, but you tell me on the phone recently that you kind of stepped away from it for a lot of years. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, first of all, it was very, for me now, you know, you got guys that, that, um, have been doing this thing straight through and have found a way to do it and whatnot. But for me, it was a frantic pace and, um, and I did it for 20 years and on staff and, you know, working under quotas and traveling. And, uh, I also was, you know, um, uh, doing those GMA conferences, a GMA conferences, uh, with, uh, with uh, the guys, you know, teaching songwriting and, and, you know, leaving on Thursday and coming back on Sunday night. And I did that for three years and I was, you know, it just seems like. I was just absolutely trying to write that many songs. You got to understand too, as you know, but your audience may not. Once you write them, I was not just a lyric writer. I was in the studio all the time. I mean, I was playing the piano and stuff. I was making demos. I was, you know, writing musicals. I was, you know, and man, it was just an unbelievable pace. Right. <laughs> and it and it left me very little time to do anything else. Um, you know, I would get invited to go see my songs performed here or there or wherever they may be or recorded in, you know, famous places or whatever. And I just, uh, I couldn't do it. I had stuff that was on the table in front of me that had to be done and a stack of stuff on the piano that had to be addressed. Right. And, yeah, yeah. um, and so I got, uh, my son was born in 1999 and uh, my contract was up. My last contract was up in 2001. Well, he was he was two, you know, a couple years old. And uh, I got a phone call from the publisher. They took me down to Ferguson's on West End. There was steak. There was Pellegrino and asparagus. And you know what, John? <laughs> when you get Pellegrino and asparagus on the table, you know they're serious. So... Uh, <laughs> 
you know, they they <laughs> offered me another a five year stint and uh, they're very generous. And I came home, told my wife that they offered me five more years, and uh, you know, and <clears throat> you know, it was gonna you know be difficult and whatnot, but man, it's five more. She said, well, great. What not? She'd been around this. Uh, my wife's very kind of low key about the whole thing. And, uh, and I'll tell you, I couldn't go to sleep that night. I could not go to sleep. And I wandered in his room at about three o'clock in the morning and I watched him sleep and I was just staring at him. And there he was. And I thought to myself, I can't do this. I'm going to, I'm going to miss it. I can't, I can't, because I can't do the kind of job I need to do. Now, some guys can't, right? <clears throat> this is absolutely not a judgment call on anybody. But for me, I knew the way I had to work and what I needed to do to do five more years and fulfill the, those kind of quotas. You're talking about, you know, another 250 co-writes, right? It's like I said. Uh, and demos and all of the time that it took and the travel and the, uh, just the whatever I knew, man, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to look up and this kid's going to be, he's going to be gone. He's not, I'm not going to, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss all of this. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I called, I, the next morning I got up and I told my wife, I said, I don't think I should do it. And you know what she said, John, she said, okay. <laughs> that's all she said she didn't say man you know this is financially it, you know this is crazy or anything like that she went okay if that's what you feel and that's that's what you feel like god's telling you to do and that's what i told her i said that's what i feel like god's telling me to do and so i called the publisher and and the publisher said to me the first words were did somebody else offer you more money and i said no no they didn't and I said, I, I'm, I am not going to sign another deal. So um, <clears throat> I walked away from it. Uh, he's about to go to college this year. And so uh, it's not that I haven't worked in between there. Phil Nash and I started a company where we wrote uh, projects for different you know, corporations and different entities like that. But it gave me the freedom to not be under pressure. Uh, to write. And so Phil and I were business partners for 15 years and, and, um, he has, uh, gone on to, uh, Indiana to work up at Sweetwater Sound. He's their kind of key producer up there. Um, uh, and, um, uh, our, mm -hmm. we don't run our company anymore, but we had a, we had a, a company for years that allowed us to make some extra money and at the same time, uh, have the freedom to be at all my kids' baseball games, all of his karate lessons, help him with his homework at night, all, you know, whatever. I didn't, I didn't miss anything. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I probably have a couple of hundred less recordings than I would have uh, if I'd been working at that pace over the last, you know, 15, you know, 17 years, something like that. But, uh, you know, it was worth it. It was, it was really one of the better choices I've ever made. Wow. Well, what, what a, a godly, awesome thing, you know, to choose your kid, uh, you know, at the risk of a career. And, and now, you know, I alluded to it earlier. I mean, you're, you, you feel like you're kind of getting back involved again or re reincarnating your career here or what's well, going on you currently? Know, well, you know, when, when, um, uh, my kid got to be a senior in high school, <clears throat> And it was kind of the last part of his uh, career um, and uh, his, his academic career here um, before he's uh, headed off to, he's going to Knoxville to school actually next week. But um, he is, uh, you know, very a very funny guy and a very, very, uh, you know, pragmatic guy. But he's, you know, very serious about his faith at the same time. And, you know, I started looking at that when he was a senior in high school. Going, man, he's really developed into a, a, a really good guy. I'm really, really proud of him. And I thought, you know what? He's okay. 
he's going to be okay. And that it just hit me for the first time that he's okay, right? He can do it on his mm-hmm. own now. Mm-hmm. Now it's mm-hmm. not that I won't I won't be there for him, but I just knew at that point that he was all right. And mm. uh, his 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 faith is intact, which is the the key thing to me. I thought, man, if you if you don't raise your child up, um, in you know the ways of God, then you kind of have missed the whole point, right? Mm. And mm. and mm-hmm. uh, and so he was academically sound. <clears throat> he's he's a you know understands how to communicate with people. Um, you know, he's just a very, very well balanced kid. And I, it hit me that he's okay. And the minute it hit me, I started looking back through my book because I never quit writing down ideas. You know, you've always got that radar out, uh, writing down song titles and ideas for songs and whatever. And I probably had, I don't know, four or 500 titles in my book. Uh, I don't put them on the computer. I still write in a book, which people taunt me about that, but that's just the way way it has to be. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, I started pulling these titles out and taking a look at them and writing them. And so I've actually put together a pretty good collection of lyrics that I've started handing them out a little bit. I sent sent a couple out uh, to uh, the arranger, Phil Keverton, uh, uh, Mm -hmm. recently, and he came back with a couple of great, melodies and great great music for the stuff and i sent some others out to some friends of mine that are artists and and whatnot and so they're trickling back in and and whatnot but i've got i've got a pretty good you know little notebook of of uh complete lyrics now so it's uh randy cox and i just uh wrote one that uh you know don cook uh finished and boy he you know don as he usually does just Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. knocked it out of the ballpark so you know, it's Absolutely. it's uh, it's fun for me uh, to to do this and not feel like I'm missing anything because you know my, I feel like in a lot of ways I feel like my job is done. Right, I have laid the foundation. I did not miss him growing up, and that job is done now. I can look kind of focus more on uh, you know writing and. And kind of getting back into it. And, you know, again, some guys can do it. I think some guys balance it pretty well uh, and, and and don't miss their kids. They're able to write and be at their games and all that stuff. I just knew that the way I did it and how, how you know, it how much energy it took and how much time it took, I knew that I just personally couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. this is, you know, it's fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, starting to – you know, see, see what's, uh, see what's going on again. See if we can't, can't rekindle it a little bit. Wow. Wow. Well, that's exciting, man. I'm uh, excited about what's to come, uh, as you harvest all those 500 ideas and still so well connected in to where, you know, you can go get that done. I'd like to kind of go back a little bit and just talk about, you know, you were an English, uh, teacher, music teacher, English and music, right? Um, back in the day, right. and a, and a basket, baseball and basketball coach to be. That's right. But talk a little bit about the value of language, as because I, you know, I deal with so many, so many songwriters, and they can, you know, maybe write a little bit of music or whatever. So many of them struggle on the lyric side, and I keep saying, read, read, read. You know, study words. If you're gonna, if you're gonna write beautiful words, you got to be filled with beautiful words and. I feel like a stuck record, but talk a little bit about the value, uh, you know, maybe some of your favorite authors and how you look at, you know, pulling song ideas out of that kind of stuff or you know, just whatever, whatever you have on your heart. But I, I think it's just such a, a value. And I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, from you around that topic. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, let's see where to start. I read a lot. <laughs> You know, there was there was one quarter in uh, college, and I was on the quarter system at Georgia State in Atlanta, where I went to school, um, where I had Renaissance literature, uh, Southern literature, and modern American literature in the same quarter. And wow. these books, the, I mean, you know, these things are nine hundred pages, right? And yeah. 
you, you're talking about reading half of Faulkner's works, half the the Fairy Queen, Shakespeare's stuff. You're talking about some oh of and, I, and, oh and all at, at the same time, right? And, right, uh, man, that's and, overwhelming. And so, <clears throat> you know, I had always read as a kid, and in, in, in uh, you know, in high school, I really enjoyed uh, the kind of more philosophical stuff and and uh you know got to college and they made me read all this stuff to to uh you know in classes and man i'm telling you i just used to sit in the library and you'll you'll find this interesting but you know um i used to sit the george state's pulling library houses all the johnny mercer papers uh, and mm. Johnny, you know, wrote Moon River and Skylark, and, and he's a Georgian. Oh, yeah. And so when he died, his wife gave all the stuff to Georgia State. And I sat in a cubicle every day of my life and read, overlooking. I would, could look out to the side of my cubicle and look into the Johnny Mercer part of the library, and his Oscar mm. for Moon River was under glass in there. Mm. And and then a big picture of Johnny and Frank Sinatra up on the wall because it was like a little museum that you would go through in the library. Mm. And so uh, every day of my life, I looked at Johnny Mercer's Oscar for Moon River and read and looked at it and read and looked at it and read. And then I'd wander through the library. His Grammy for Days of Wine and Roses was in there and mm. his uh, his original lyric. You know, stuff written in his hand on on mm. some of these Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe and stuff like that. Just, just mm. you know, just blew me away. And so I became this Johnny Mercer, you know, kind of connoisseur, and and he was such a <clears throat> lyrical influence. And I started looking at how he crafted lyrics. And just a brilliant man. I mean, you know, just the 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 pictures, you know, right? And um, and that's my point. As I was reading. And my concentration was in Victorian poetry uh, in college, and the Victorian poets were known for imagery, right? But not just imagery, not just painting pictures, but sensory stuff, right? And so you've got these poets that are just pouring out their poetry from the five senses, and they're, they're painting pictures everywhere. And whatnot, and that's how I learned how to write song. I learned from all of the reading, from all of the poetry, from everything that I did, and everything that I taught subsequently when I was a teacher. All of the the imagery, and, and still to this day, I tend to write in metaphor a lot. Now that that varies. If I'm writing for myself, I write in metaphor. If you're writing for a group that's pointed toward, you know. If you're writing for a group that's pointed toward a younger audience, maybe, you know, 12 to 20 year old girls or whatever, you can't break out the prologue to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, right? <laughs> they're probably <laughs> not going to cut it. Not going to get so, it. <laughs> right. Well, they're not, they're not going to record it, right? And, uh, and so you have to find a balance in there to, as, as to what you write for what audience and what group you're writing for. But, uh, it, at the very least, I like to think that even the songs that I pointed toward a younger audience, you know, more kind of pop, pop gospel stuff, had some alliteration, had some personification, had some imagery, you know, had some, you know, maybe a little metaphor here and there or some mm -hmm. assembly or some some mm -hmm. type of literary device that I had, you know, that I had just pounded into my head over years of reading both, uh, you know, great novels from, from uh, you know, one end of the spectrum to the other to, you know, poem after poem after poem after poem. And once you mm -hmm. do that, as you, as you know, John, you know what I'm talking about, but you, mm -hmm. you, you start to think in those terms. And, and the more you read, the more you put in you, the more you do it automatically, right? You, you automatically, mm -hmm alliteration comes to the forefront automatically these uh the the pictures and i always when i wrote i would always and i don't know why i did this this was i don't know 
I don't know. I have no idea, but this is this is the truth. When I wrote, I would stand in the middle of a football stadium on the fifty yard line, not physically stand, but in my mind, I would stand there. Mm. Right, empty football stadium on the in the middle of the football field on the fifty yard line, and I would go, "All right, what's below me? There's grass. It's green. It smells great. I smell the lime on the field, right from the hash marks." I smell the cut grass. I smell the soil. I, I see the green grass, right? I see the indivi- individual blades. I look at the blades. Okay, when I look up, what do I see? I see a blue sky. I see the sun cutting through the clouds. I see the formations of the clouds. What do I smell? Well, maybe I smell a, a popcorn vendor, right, who's getting ready for the game, right? And so what my point is, I, when I wrote a song, I would go through, I'd put myself in the middle of the song and, and say, what do I feel? And, and then I would try to write about it on every level, you know, sight, smell, touch, taste, right, you know, the whole thing. And so um, I think that this training and the, all of the reading that I did uh, and all of the imagery that I took in, you know, kind of just permeated my being to where that's how I wrote. And I, so I would find this, this uh, way to tap into all my senses. And, you know, again, you find balance. You do it at different levels according to what your, uh, you know, uh, the audience that you're writing for. But mm-hmm. nonetheless, it's still, it's still there. And it still comes from, uh, comes from, uh, you know, a lot of years of just pouring that kind of thing into your mind. Uh, so anyway, that's that's kind of the best way I can describe it and what my experience with, with both, you know, being an English major and also teaching English for several years when I was a uh, student. You know, I taught for three years after college before uh, Randy uh, signed me. And so, uh, you know, between the time the year after, and then I moved to a public school or to a bigger school uh, for a couple of years, and, and then Randy signed me. And I was actually in graduate school too at the University of Georgia. And man, I'm telling you, all that stuff. The minute he offered me that contract, <laughs> that stuff went away. Graduate school, mm-hmm. teaching, everything else, right? And uh, I left all of that immediately to come here and make fifty dollars a song uh, advance. And, mm, you know, mm. aren't I, aren't I glad, right? But I knew, yeah. I knew I had prayed about this and prayed about it and prayed about it. I knew it was what I was supposed to be doing. There was no doubt in my mind. Now, my father, my mother, everybody I knew, you know, I think they thought, man, what's that idiot doing? Right. Mm. But, uh, you know, when you know, you know, and if and they're not the ones spending long hours, you know, praying about something and, and, you know, trying to get to the bottom of God's heart as far as his will for your life is concerned. And I was. And so I knew and my wife trusted me. And that's, uh, you know, that's saying something. But, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. you know, that that's uh, that's uh, the way <laughs> the way that went. And that's wow. that's kind of the story of the whole, you know, training thing. Wow. Wow. Well, what what a rich uh, and and varied, I mean, uh, career uh, with with all the recording and arranging and production, which you're you're still doing a lot of that now. Right. I mean, you're you're, you're in the middle of a project well, now. Uh, yeah, I was never much. Uh, you know, my arranging was I never got paid to arrange almost everything you hear of mine that has key changes in it or certain arranging techniques is, is me. Right. It's not an arranger, but I was never a guy that, you know, I did it a couple of times, but I was never a guy that just sat down and arranged notes or orchestrated or things like that. My music training, my father was a music professor uh, when he was young. He taught at Troop McConnell College in the North Georgia Mountains. And uh, and then I had an incredible piano teacher named Dorothy Hess uh, when I was 13, 14, 15 years old. And it wasn't the piano that she taught me. It was the absolute pounding in me of scales 
and chord structures and harmonic forms. And I'm telling you, she, you know, beat the metaphorical daylights out of me with that whole thing. And it really, 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 I would show up to play the piano and she was, you know, she was a, a fine piano teacher, but she was even a better theory teacher. And, um, and so my music training between a father that was a, you know, music professor and that Miss Hess, who was a great theory teacher and piano teacher, my music training was complete. I had this ancillary, you know, music training. Then I added the language training in school, and suddenly, you know, you've got a songwriter. And I never knew what was happening to me. Uh, but what mm. was obviously happening was God was shaping me to do a job, right? And that was, uh, and I didn't even realize it. It was, mm. it was just what, I, what was going on. And then I look mm. back now and I go, oh, you know, like we so often do, oh, he, he kind of had his hand on this whole thing, <laughs> this whole thing. Imagine that. So, yeah, kind of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's amazing. So you're you're working on the cast recording from Miracle in Bedford Falls right now. I guess right. that's what I was what was in my mind yeah. about what you're working on now. Yeah. You know, about 15 years ago, Mark Cavanis and I wrote a, uh, a Broadway style musical around um, uh, It's a Wonderful Life called Miracle in Bedford Falls. And, uh, you know, it's been um, out for a long time. It's been performed in a lot of different places. And we were talking uh, recently. We had some early disappointments with it. We got kicked in the teeth a couple of times, almost had productions and whatever. And these productions, you know, when you're talking about th these aren't um, these are, you know, regional theaters, community theaters, but just those type of, you know, those type of things. And when you're talking about those productions, you're talking about a lot of work and a lot of money and a lot of time uh, for these people to put them together correctly. And a lot of people, a lot of manpower, you know, the whole thing. And we had um, a couple of theaters early on, fairly early on after we'd written it. And we were prepared to wait. We know what that means. But we had a couple of theaters that almost did it. And then they would back out and then it would be heartbreaking. And you know, whatnot, but, but long story short, uh, uh, Southern Appalachian Repertory in Asheville or outside of Asheville premiered it uh, years ago. And um, subsequently, after they premiered it, people started doing it. And then the Steel Spring Stage Rights in LA, uh, which is a, 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 a theater, a publisher and distributor, picked the show up. And so now they publish it and distribute it nationwide, actually worldwide. But but it's a uh, um, you know one of those things that was kind of a labor of love, right? Something I'd never done mm -hmm. before is to write a show. And so I sat down and and I started realizing why guys like Rogers and Hammerstein only had like six or seven shows in their entire lives, right, or whatever. Some some. So you'd think these guys would have, you know, 50, 60 shows, but six or seven, like, really known shows. And you realize how long it takes and how much work it is and what a what an absolute just undertaking something like that mm -hmm. is. I had, no, I had no idea when I got started. And Cavanis wrote this uh, really nice libretto around the story, and then I wrote all the songs for it. And so it was, uh, you know, one of those things to where – if I think if I had known what I was getting into, I don't know that I would that I would have done it. I haven't done it again <laughs> since, have I? It's kind of like putting yeah, your hand yeah, on the yeah. stovetop. <laughs> right. <laughs> if, it, if it burns, don't do it again. But yeah, uh, but, but here, all these years later, yeah. and the fruit is there. That's all fantastic. Years, yeah, but all these all these years later, we Mark and I were talking, and we have never done. You now the orchestrations are out there. You know the the all the stuff is out there but we've never done a cast recording of it. Uh, there are recordings, there are demo recordings for the people that perform it, but there's no cast recording uh, to be, uh, you know, enjoyed or sold right. or anything else. And so that's what we've decided to do all these years later. And, and we're in the middle of doing that. And that's, that's as big a hassle and mess as the writing of the musical. So it's, wow. uh, you know, wow. you got to understand that that thing 
is like it was 19 or 20 new songs and like 45 or 46 individual pieces between on tracks and stage music to change and all this different stuff, man. It's, it was, you know, and then Chris Rice, uh, uh, Chris Miller arranged it. Um, uh, he's a Broadway guy. Burl Red helped us develop it. Um, nice. before, he, before he passed away, that was one of the last yeah. things Burl did is help us develop the show. You know, Burl was up there in New York working. Rupert Holmes had a hand in it. Uh, mm. uh and he wrote us a, uh, great, uh, you know, endorsement to it, but he would listen and go, ah, you know, you're missing a song here and whatnot. And of course, Rupert uh, has, I don't know how many Tony awards now, but, uh, mm. uh, mm. but, but he, you know, he, he is, uh, he went, people, People, I, I don't think people understand. Though I think the last, the last I knew, Rupert was here in Nashville. He wrote with Jerry Lewis. He wrote the, uh, um, you know, the Nutty Professor musical with Hamlish and Jerry Lewis. And mm-hmm. so we've we've been very fortunate. But these guys, these men, have really, really just contributed right to to uh, this show and. Uh, you know, trying to make it better all the time. And that's another thing you rewrite, 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 add a song, take a song out to, you know, see how the audience reacts. Oh man, the audience just fell flat. Let's take it out. Let's put another one in this place. You know, it's a, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a wild ride. Those doing those things. And I, I I will probably never do another one, but we're trying to put a cash Mm. recording. I know I'm rambling, but we're trying to put a cash recording on this thing now. Fascinating. That's awesome. Well, congratulations on that and much more success to come. I have two more questions as we kind of wrap this thing up. This has been rich and <laughs> really an awesome uh, talk today, Lowell. But um, t- tell me the two songs you can't sing and why. Oh, OK. The two songs I can't sing. That, that's something that I talk about to people sometime. They're Amazing Grace and Jesus Loves Me. And the reason I can't sing them is because every time I start, I start to cry. <laughs> and mm. that <laughs> is the absolute fact of the matter. I'm telling you, mm. I get through about two lines of Amazing Grace, and then I have to just put my head down. And then I mm. get to the, and then I, then about midway through it, I try to, I always pick my head back up and start singing again. And then when it goes to when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. Mm -hmm. I haven't, I I haven't sung that in years. I can't get it Mm -hmm. out. I just Mm -hmm. can't. I'm I'm so choked by then. I can't, I just can't get it out. And Mm -hmm. then the other thing is Jesus loves me, you know, there's a difference between surface lyrics and simple lyrics. And mm. there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, surface stuff that goes on out there uh, that just is, you know, just, I don't know. It, it just doesn't, there's no poetry in it. There's no whatever. Then, then, then it's always been that way, I suppose. But there, there's a lot of surface stuff that goes out there, but something that's simple yet profound that sums up, to me, the gospel, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, right? Little ones mm-hmm. to him belong, they are weak, he is strong. Then it's, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Man, I'm, I'm telling you, I get about two lines into that, too, and it's over. I mean, I can barely talk wow. about it. It's, it's wow. such, such a simple and profound uh, you know, when you, all of the stuff you go through in life, all the ups and downs, you know, the struggles, the trials, stuff with your health, losing your parents, um, you know, all of the above. And then it, you can bring it down to a point of, yes, Jesus loves me for the Bible tells me so. Man, I'm telling you, John, it just raises the hair on my head. Every time I think mm. about that. Mm. Wow. Well, I don't know if you know, but Anna Bartlett Warner wrote those lyrics to Jesus Loves Me. And I think she and her sister, uh, Susan, 
uh, Warner served the West Point cadets, taught the Bible on Constitution Island to the, which was just kind of like uh, right there is at the uh, Hudson River, uh, right across from West Point. I think they're the only two civilians buried in the West Point uh, cemetery. I've actually been there and seen her grave and uh, with our dear friend, uh, songwriter Nancy Gordon, and uh, who is uh, uh, kind of an Anna B um, aficionado, knows uh, so much about Anna B. But yeah, that that's so amazing. Lowell, uh, such a tender heart. And, uh, and I love what you said, you know, there's a difference between surface and simple and simple wins the day. So, yeah. Simple, awesome. simple can be very profound. It can be very yeah. profound if it's done correctly, but, um, mm. you know, if, when it is done correctly and when it kind of reaches and I don't know, it just reaches into the depths of your being, especially as a Christian, you know, I'm, I, I know, you know, if you're not a Christian, that's not going to mean anything to you, but man, when you are and it's real and you know it, and the Holy Spirit speaks through it. I mean, it'll it'll blow you away, rock your world. Oh. Well, what would you say to an aspiring songwriter that listens to your story? You know, the decades of work, six hundred songs, Amy Grant, Art Garfunkel, all of this, and they're like, "Well, dang, I, what am I supposed to do?" You know, what what would you say to them? Uh, you know, patience. Is, is one thing, you know, one thing that happened to me a lot, I would get people um, that called me and over the years, you know, friends or, or people I used to go to church with or go to school with or, you know, this, that and the other. And they would find they they'd find me or call my mother and, you know, that kind of thing. And, hey, where is he? Can I talk to him? This, that or the other or at these AGMA conferences or. Oh, uh, any, any time I was out, right. Or, you know, somebody would know somebody or whatever. And, and to a T, every one of those people was impatient. I would try to explain to them that, you know, this, you don't want to meet a publisher if you're not ready. That is such a small music row is such a, well, back then, you know, now they've kind of mown half of the row down. But uh, back then, you know, it was a small place and uh, and everybody knew each other. And you really need to be sort of prepared. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be completely developed, but you also can't can't go in and, uh, you know, just uh, not not be a, a, on baby food when you, when you play for these guys. They're they're very busy and they're, you're in you're in a world of a lot of competition. You know, and that being said, you know, from somebody who was told, you know, that there'll be no place for you here in this town. I can't see you making a living here. Uh, I don't I didn't I don't think you can do it. Uh, I mean, how many uh, you know, I could just go down the list of how many mm. people, you know, not getting not having my phone calls returned. Even that, even if somebody met me and said, call me, then I would call them. No, no return phone call, which I. And that's my pet peeve with that whole thing. That's a whole nother story. But man, I mean, you know, you don't get your phone call returned. It's like basically just somebody slapping you in the face. I think it's pretty, pretty awful. But, mm. you know, it, it's a, it's a, to a T, these people would want, you know, you get me in front of a publisher and you do it now. And I would try to go, let me take a look at your progression. I'll, I'll be happy to help you. Let me, let me take a look. Here's what I would suggest. This this melody doesn't work here. You got to make the chorus do this. This lyric doesn't work. It doesn't speak back to the title of the song. It, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I would give them concrete things to work on. And they would get very frustrated with me. Very frustrated that, that I want it now. And I want it now. And I want it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and and uh and I was and I just want to go man alive. I mean, I wrote probably 200 terrible songs between the time I was 12 and the time I was 20 years old, right? I mean, terrible. 
I, and and I, man, you know, I loved it. It was it was some of the most fun I've ever had in my life. It's writing those songs. But when you look back at them now, I mean, it, they're horrible. Uh, but it was training, right? It was training. And then under the the eye of a publisher like Randy, uh, uh, you know, started shaping you know the songs and and Rich too. I've I've got vivid memories of Rich's hand coming over my shoulder and pointing at lyrics, sitting at his piano in his home. He had an old chickering uh, upright there, mm-hmm. and he would he would sit beside me in a, on a stool right down below me. And I, w- I would sit at the piano on the bench and he would play the guitar and I would watch what he was playing and play the piano to, with what he was playing. And then I remember once I, I said to him, I said, man, what'd you just do? And he looked at me like he was so disgusted. <laughs> and he said, pay attention. <laughs> wow. Pay attention. That's what I got from Rich Mullins. Not, oh, here's what it is, Lowell. It was <sighs> pay attention. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, you should be good enough to get this, right? And so that's when I knew, um, you know, he also said to me once, he said, you know, being a, uh, a staff writer is, is a different animal, you know, because Rich was a staff writer before he was an artist. And he said, you know, uh, it separates the the uh, the men from the boys when you have to get up in the morning and write and you don't feel like it. You're not on some mountaintop with a light shining down on your head, right? You maybe have mm-hmm. had a, you don't feel good or, you know, you're tired or something and you got to go do your job. And he's like, that's what separates the men from the boys. And then he looked at me and he had a cup of coffee in his hand. And he goes, are you a man or a boy? <laughs> Wow, he, he was tough on. Wow, me, but, but I'm Take telling that. you, that yeah, Jeez. but he but he he motivated me and he <laughs> looked he looked after me and he would reach over my shoulder and point and go I don't like those words right there right and then he would sit down and play and sit beside me and and so he was a huge influence on my direction as a songwriter and also understanding that I needed development. When I was sitting there with Rich Mullins, trust me, I knew who the songwriter was and who the baby guy with the eating wow. the Gerbers was, right? Wow. And, uh, wow. And it was, uh, it was, you know, sort of intimidating, to be honest with you, but, but he, um, he taught me a lot uh, just about the craft of writing. And then I had Randy on the other side, a, a you know, very, you know, just, uh, you know, brilliant song guy. Mm. And so, you know, I learned, but that's what I would tell young kids, learn, find people that will teach you and take the time. It took me years, years, and that's years as a professional, right? That's not just years, uh, the years before. That was years as a professional to learn and to be patient and to Work for free. I mean, you know, man, fifty dollars a song. I mean, you know, that that barely paid for the gas to get back and forth home, right? And lunch. Mm. And so, you know, I was for the first three years of my career, I was basically working for free to prove myself. But you know, now mm. people come in and they want money and they want stuff to happen uh, immediately, and they want this, that, and the other, and it's and really, uh, that's just not the way it works. It's not the way right. it works. And so patience and and perseverance and and hearing what God wants from you. You know, it I think too, people get really confused with wanting some kind of celebrity or something that, you know, unfortunately goes along with, you know, putting music out there, not for the songwriter, but but for artists. And, you know, uh, and that's just not what you should be after. You know, it's really, it really isn't. Um, the, the bigger artists that I know from Christian music, the ones that have sold the, the most records, are usually the ones that shy away from that type of uh, thing. They, they can't help it. You know, they have millions of records out there, and they sing to hundreds of thousands of people. But 
in their hearts, they shy away from it. And, wow. uh, you know, I, I think that you don't, you don't need to come here looking for celebrity. You don't need to come here looking to get rich. You don't need to come doing, you know, anything that's not about the will of God in your life and what serves the music, right? Mm. Not yourself, wow. but the music. Jeez, that's so hard to, to remember. That's hard to balance. And uh, it's amazing to me, you know, how the spirit of Rich Mullins still kind of hovers over a lot of this town and a lot of a lot of people that I've talked to who are long timers. You know, it's come up in other podcasts and uh, discussions, you know, just how influential, you know, he he was and remains to this day. So this is um it's powerful. Thank you for sharing those stories and giving us some insight, uh, you know, into your life, this journey that you've been on and you're still on and uh, the not just the pretty parts, but the struggle and, uh, you know, the influence of Rich and Randy and other people. But, man, thank you so much, Lowell. I mean, we could go on and on, man. This is deep and, and awesome. This is going to be required listening to every client we have at Nashville Christian songwriters to just, you know, begin to uh, uh, take in some of these things you've said. So thank you so much for your time, man. And uh, we, we sure wish you the best in this new season, your son, as he goes off to college, uh, uh, will this be empty nest for you guys? Oh yeah. Yeah. We have one kid and, and he's, he's got to go uh, get the job done now. So it, now, now there it's you his go. turn. His turn to go over there and and uh, get uh, <laughs> get kicked around a little bit while he learns how there to do all that, all that work. But John, I appreciate well, you, I, man, and and I I, I just uh, I'd like to say one thing, man. You're an absolute beast. So just never forget that. <laughs> Probably smell like a beast. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, man, dude, I'm, well, I'm, I'm really happy for you, John, and I, I, I wish you the best i really do uh thanks man thanks well you've been a delight today and uh just we look forward to maybe having you on the show again when we're celebrating some new things in your new season so lowell All alexander right. blessings man thanks john Hey, everybody. I hope that you know by now that we here at Nashville Christian Songwriters are all about empowering you to fulfill your call to become a great Christian songwriter. And the best thing that I think you can do is to join a like-minded community of, of believing songwriters dedicated to fulfill that call. So I want to invite you to jump over to NashvilleChristianSongwriters.com, even right now, to check out what we call NCS Membership, where you can go deeper into all the resources that will kickstart your creativity, unlock hidden songwriting abilities that you didn't even know you had, and take some important steps towards becoming the songwriter that you were born to be. I believe that you were born to be heard, and NCS Membership helps you get there. I'll see you next time.